We'll go ahead and get started, and I'll make sure that I, I end at 8.45 and don't go over. So, uh, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you. We give you all the praise and glory. We thank you for another day. Lord, uh, thank you so much for this class, these folks that are such awesome people. So I pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us uh, in this class and in the, the next service. Let the word of God go forth, Lord, and teach us, prepare us for ministry that we can continue to share the gospel. So we pray for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So j just to give you an update um, with my chemo. So I uh, went to get the fourth round Wednesday and Thursday, but they couldn't give it to me because my white blood cell counts were slightly low. So when, when they wasn't bad, but he says, no, we're just going to hold off for two weeks. So they pushed it back two weeks and then they'll give me a shot to increase my, my blood, white blood cell count. So everything else was great. They gave me CAT scans and it looks excellent. So all the lymph nodes are shrunk. Um, they're normal. And so God is really good there. So... So if you see me wearing a mask again, that's what's going on. He says, avoid the crowds and closed in, things like that. If you get a temperature, head to the doctor, ER room or something like that. But so far I've been blessed. So just want to give you an update on that because I believe that God's got this under control. So, so this morning uh, on your handout there, we're going to be talking about the fruits of biblical ministry, the fruits of biblical ministry. And uh, you have to understand, like, uh, if you're going to pr uh, produce fruit, it requires being grounded in ministry. And we, we've been using this fruits of biblical uh, ministry and the fruit by the bushel. <coughs> we've been talking about how to produce fruit and continually to produce it, which means um, you have to be involved in ministry to produce fruit. There are, there are a number of people who, who want to just go out and out on the street, and that's evangelism. That's evangelizing. That's sharing the gospel. That's not producing fruit. It, it, indirectly it is, but it's not. The, you produce fruit, you know, well, okay, John 15 says, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you that you may, you may go and produce fruit. So evangelizing is somewhat producing fruit, but that scripture also says that the fruit should remain, which means you go out and evangelize, and now you want that fruit. You don't want to plant a tree and it and it produces fruit for one year. And that's it. You want that tree to keep producing apples and oranges and whatever the tree is, or if it's a vine, grapes, you want that to be continual. You, no one wants to plant a tree, and, or you're like us, we buy flowers and don't plant them in the ground because we don't have much room to plant flowers in the ground because the guys will come by and cut them with the lawnmower. But you want to plant flowers because you want them to come up every year. That's producing fruit that remains. And that's what you want when you go out and, and share the gospel. You want to disciple them. You want them to learn the word of God and you want them to continue to. And that's what somebody did with you. You know, and so, so that's, that's our calling as a believer to be grounded in ministry. So, and that takes on different forms for different people. And, uh, but when you get down to it, biblical ministry is centered on God's word. That's the focus that we will be looking at. Uh, because once we become rooted, we grow, we share the, the gospel, we minister, and then we finally produce fruit. So we want to look at biblical ministry this morning, that we must first be compelled by Christ's sacrifice on the cross to share the good news with others. So if the cross doesn't compel you, then you have a problem. 
You know, you need to go back and rethink what you're doing. And then secondly, we need to see the importance and the necessity of ministry in this local church. It's one thing to have a church where a bunch of people show up, but if there's no ministry, they're not doing anything. That's a dead church. And so, praise the Lord, we have a church that there are a number of ministries in this church and outside this church that that many of you are involved in. And so, and then thirdly, you have to make a personal decision to be involved in that ministry. Just because the church has a bunch of ministries, you have to say, okay, I want to be involved in that. And so, and there, there's a difference between service and ministry. Service is ushering, uh, hospitality, uh, shuttle driving, uh, safety, the, the medical team, those are all service. So you very seldom get a chance to sit down with somebody in any of those instances and take them through the Word of God fully. Now, you might be able to witness as a part of your service. You could, you know, if you see somebody and they get on your shuttle, um, you could say, and they're a visitor, you know, you, you could say something like, hey, God loves you. You know, even phrases like that. And it's a, sometimes a person could be having a really tough day, and the fact that you just say something like that could lift their spirits. But you've got to go further in ministry by sharing the Word of God with them. That's what ministry is all about, and that's what we want to do. So, so obviously, discipleship comes into play when you think about that. So, uh, to really be rooted in biblical ministry means you're willing to sacrifice the time to share with someone one-on-one in a discipleship. Take the Bible and, and explain to them what it means. That's why we have these discipleship lessons, these 16 lessons, which are fundamental lessons that take you from salvation to the judgment seat of Christ. And, and so that's, that's our foundation, our church foundation. So just recently, um, I did a three-night educational session at what they call the Union District uh, Congress. The Union District is, is Missionary Baptists in the urban area, and they have about 12 churches in that, in that Union District. And so they invited me to come for three nights and do an educational session, a one-hour session each night. And I laid out the philosophy of discipleship. I laid that out, and I guarantee you, a lot of those pastors who were sitting there, they just were staring at me because it's not something that they were used to hearing. You know, and I grew up in the, in the Black Baptist Church. I grew up with my dad was a minister, and, and uh, I was a part of those churches all my life. And what happens is discipleship was never a focal point of that. The whole fellowship and the celebration was there, but there were a lot of people who were missing, you know, discipleship. So when you sit down and you take somebody through these lessons, believe me, you're giving them profound stuff. I met with one of the pastors Saturday, and he said to me, he's an older pastor. He said, man, in 40 years, I just haven't heard that. And, you know, I thought, okay. I said, maybe you've been trying to do it all by yourself. And you've been preaching and good singing, but they need more. And so, uh, so you know, you should count yourself, uh, really, I would, what word I want to use? Uh, bless, because you're in a church that has a discipleship ministry, that has a mission ministry, evangelism, all of that, children's ministry, youth, uh, that's a blessing. And so don't count that as just anything. Just, so you want to be sold out to ministry. So, so as I say all that, being sold out to ministry is a wonderful thing. But, and I'm going to pick on the men this morning, the home must not be secondary in your commitment. And I'm, I'm thinking... All of the men, including me, we men are notorious for forgetting our wives and family celebrations. 
And I know I'm not getting any amens because I don't hear any amens. And so, so, but we're notorious for forgetting our wives and family celebrations. Yes, ministry has its value and importance, but we must redeem the time. Uh, we don't have to be here. We don't have to be there every time the door opens. We just don't. And th now this applies to men and women, but all of us need to re-examine how ministry involvement affects our home. Uh, we can have a good balance if we take it to the Lord in prayer and be willing to make necessary changes because if we think that ministry will fail because we're not there, we're fooling ourselves. You know, we have to make sure that we are maintaining the balance. And that's why I said we men are notorious for forgetting our wives' birthday, our wives' anniversary, uh, kids, you know, all that. We get so busy that we forget that. Second Corinthians 5, 14 to 21 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one die for all, then we're all dead. Verse 15 said, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Living unto yourselves means, oh, this ministry, but it's just you. You're forgetting about the rest of the people in your life. But unto him which died for them and rose again. It's just saying, unto Christ. So Charles Stanley broke the scripture down this way. And I was reading that. Verse 14 and 15, he said, do you think that God would have us relieve someone's hunger but not show them how to be saved from the fires of hell? You know, he's saying, oh, you're feeding people, you're doing all these things, but you're not sharing the gospel. They need to hear that. He said, is it enough to give a drink of water or clothe someone without ever taking the opportunity to present the gospel? Of course not. If the love of Christ compels us to provide for people's earthly needs, how much more will his love cause us to show them the way to forgiveness and eternal life, their greatest need? That's their greatest need. Verse 16 says, when for, when, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now and henceforth know we, we him no more. So Charles Stanley continues in verse 17. He says, where it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He says that the new birth experience is exactly what God says it is, a fresh beginning. When we are born again, we're, we not only have our sin forgiven and our guilt removed, but we receive the Holy Spirit who come to indwell in us and live Christ's life through us. We can never be what we were before because we were born into his new life with his new spirit and nature. And because of that, our desires and goals should be conformed to those that God has for us. And that's why I said, us men, we have to be careful. We get so wrapped up in ministry and, and ladies that we forget about the people that God has put in our presence, our families, you know, so, uh, unquote. So, so like Paul, we should be absolutely captivated by the love of Christ. Uh, Paul was grateful for the love of Christ and he was constrained, that's that word, the constrained, to continue his service because of it. And Paul certainly would never forget his salvation on the Damascus Road because it was then he was given a new purpose for living out the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 20, and we're, we're on that, that scripture that's on your handout there, in verse 20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Jesus didn't know any sin. But if you really think about that deeply, he was made to be sin for us. So how can we sit back and say, Well, I know I haven't been to church in three or four weeks, but um, I'll get there, you know. I know I haven't talked to anybody about the love of Christ in a few years, but I'll get there. You know, we're taking his, his death on the cross for granted. We're saying, Lord, you did it, and we appreciate it, but, but 
but it's okay. But the, that scripture says, He had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's huge. When you figure Christ died on the cross. And uh, so regardless of your job, your profession, or you retired, you are a representative of Christ. Everywhere you go and in every situation you find yourself in, you have an opportunity to share the message of the gospel. So if you're rooted in this purpose, you can be fruitful in sharing the gospel in all aspects of people's lives. So the question is, how do we become rooted in biblical ministry? It's not a point of just joining the ministry. How do you become rooted in it? And so the answer to it is in your first hand out there, rooted in the scriptures. Rooted in the scriptures. So to produce fruit in biblical ministry, we must commit to being rooted in scripture. Because in verse 18, it, it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So, let me give you three reasons why you need to be rooted, we need to be rooted in Scripture to be effective in biblical ministry. Letter A, Scripture is the Word of God. Scripture is the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.4 says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So Scripture is the very Word of God, and it definitely carries tremendous powers. Second Peter 1 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy man of God spake men of God as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this is not on your handout, but you can write it on your there. There's three ways that you can get rooted in scripture. First of all, you need to study scripture. And I'll give you a scripture for that. Because to use scripture, you need to know it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So study the scripture, 2 Timothy 2.15. Second of all, meditate on scripture. Meditate on scripture. Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1.8 says, The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. If you want to have good success, meditate on the word. That's number two. Then number three, practice it. Practice scripture. First of all, we have to obey. James 1, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So don't deceive yourself. Be doers of the word. You know, if you can, you can come to church and hear it, but doers means you're studying it, you're, you're meditating on it, and you're practicing. So let it be said, Scripture is the center of ministry. Scripture is the center of ministry. So it's impossible to have ministry without the Word of God. Just like Paul, our ministry must be saturated with the preaching and teaching of God's Word. It has to be. Acts 6, 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So see, it's, you say, well, I pray all the time. Okay, that's great. What about the ministry of the word? Are you investing any time in the word of God? Uh, there are so many ways to do that. Pastor Shelby has a prayer diary. He has the, script, the, the whole scripture there where you can follow the daily scriptures and he has prayers there. You don't have to pray his prayer. Pray your prayer, you know. But that prayer that's there, you can read it, you know, and, and you could even use it as one of your prayers. But the whole idea is have prayer, but also have ministry. And so once we understand our role in preaching and teaching and evangelism, then we'll see because in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 on your handout, it says, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's all of us. So whatever role that you have, make sure you understand it's just as important as a pastor. And it, whatever role you have. So, so don't sell yourself cheap and say, well, I, I'm not a pastor. Well, you're a minister. When you get saved and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because you did, you now become a minister. You are an ambassador of Christ. Once you become an ambassador, it's important for you to know what that does. So, uh, so when you and I commit to discipling others, it will involve aiding them in understanding and applying the scriptures. That's, that's what discipleship does. It helps them. Letter C says, Scripture gives God's plan of reconciliation. C, Scripture gives God's plan of reconciliation. See, you see, the Bible is not just a book to study. It gives us a message to deliver, and that word is reconciliation. Because in 2 Corinthians 5.19, we read this once before, I'll read it again, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So, Jesus Christ came to earth to reconcile fallen man to himself. That's what he did. And so we are appointed to deliver that message to those who have not trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we have to be ready at all times to share the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asked you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And I know you have heard pretty much all of this. But the best way to be focused in ministry is repetition. You know, don't get to the point that, oh, I've heard that before. No, it's fresh. Make it fresh. In other words, if you get tired of it, you are going to get tired of it. But if you say, you know what, I want, I want to make an impression on those folks in my life and outside of my life, and every time I read that scripture, I'm asking God to give me something different. If you, don't, if you don't ask that, maybe the Holy Spirit won't give you anything. I don't know. But all I'm saying is, your, your attitude should be, I want to be fresh. I, I want to see something different every time. I don't want it to say the same old, same old. So number, number two says, you mean rooted in service. Rooted in service. And letter A, Christ has given us a Pacific ministry. John 20, 21, that's rooted in service. And letter A, Christ has given us a Pacific ministry. John 20, 21 says, so Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So he's saying, my Father sent me, so now I'm sending you. So we have a mandate, we have a command to go. And I know we, we camp out on Matthew, you know, 28, but the whole idea is that is true. That is the Great Commission because it, it instructs us to go. Let it be, Christ has given us a privileged office, a privileged office. You see, even if you're not a pastor or a teacher, you are an ambassador. I said that earlier. Um, just like government ambassadors are sent to other countries representing their sovereign power. Okay, you and I have a privilege to serve as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. What? That's high honor right there. I don't care if you've you got a cousin or uncle or relative or you've been an ambassador for the government and you've been to another country. And, and man, they make a big deal out of that. You know, when, when they go, they bring out all the cameras and they have photo ops and, you know, they have beautiful pictures and they have meals and all of that. And so... The ambassador goes in and they hold them with high esteem. Well, why can't we be held with high esteem? Because we're ambassador for Christ. You know, so put out the spread, you know, like cook a big meal and just invite somebody over that doesn't know the Lord. Or maybe they do know the Lord, but they've been out of church for a long time. And you're an ambassador for Christ. So you're saying, hey, I'm coming 
because I'm representing the Lord. The ambassadors in government saying they're representing the president. And even though you don't agree which president it is, you know, you might say, oh, that's not my president. No, no, he is mine. That's not mine. Well, okay. That's one thing you can't do that about Jesus Christ. He is the king, you know. He is the king. And when you go, you are an ambassador for him. There's no question. People can talk all they want about it, but he's not Muhammad. He's not Buddha. He's not Confucius. You can name off all these people. He's none of those. He is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's God. So we can see now that we've been rooted in Scripture, rooted in service, and now we want to be rooted in the Savior. Rooted in the Savior. That's number three. You see, because we're not alone. Christ enables us to serve him. The more we serve the Lord, the more we come, become fully aware that without him, we can do nothing. Without him, we can do nothing. So we have to be fully aware of that because it is him who enables us to serve. So how do we do that? Letter A, we are rooted through the gospel. We're rooted through the gospel, letter A. You know, just like people whom you might lead to the Lord, somebody led you to the Lord. Now, there's a possibility that maybe you were watching a Billy Graham crusade on television or something, and you got saved in your home as a result of that. But still, there was a connection. There was a human connection there. And maybe a lot of you got saved through your family or, or your church or whatever happened, but somebody led you to the Lord. Someone was responsible for leading you to the Lord, or it came through a, a message, a sermon message, or a Bible group setting, or something like that. So we can't forget that Christ is the center of our lives and the center of our message and our offer of salvation to, to those who need it. The Bible tells us that the gospel is the power of God to change lives and hearts. Uh, clearly seen in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I keep going back there because repetition is good. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So the power that God gives us to serve him in biblical ministry is not found in our personal abilities or personalities. That's, that's not what it is. It is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where it is. It's found there. You know, and you might say, well, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, you know, or I, I'm, I'm not good at evangelizing. Well, when you were working, or if you're still working, you get up and you go in and you punch the clock and you do what the boss tells you to do. And so you're good at the job that you were doing, so why can't you be good at sharing the gospel? It doesn't mean that you have to compare yourself to someone else because we're all different. We're all different. But you have the ability to do that, and you should do that. You should want to share the gospel with someone so they can understand who they are and their loss. And so Romans 1.16, and, and I'm saying that with, because this scripture is exactly what I'm saying. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul is saying, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I'm, I'm not a street evangelist. I can tell you that. I, you know, I'm not that guy that you see standing on the corner, you know, saying stuff. I've never been comfortable with that. But I can sit down with you if I get you in a position where we can talk, yes. But there are some people who are street evangelists. Man, they, they get out there. You know, and they can walk up and down the sidewalk with tracks and say all kinds of good stuff. You know, and there are people like, maybe that's you. Or maybe you're the person that you're more nonchalant. You're just saying, I, you know, you see somebody and say, hey, God loves you. And then, and they may come back, why did you say that? And you might, you got to be ready for that. And say, well, because he does. And then they may open up to you. You know, maybe they're going through something in their family. They're going through something in, on their job. Or in their church. Yes, in church. Because people get hurt in churches. You know, uh, big time. And so what we have to do is be ready with an answer. 
So we, we don't want to be ashamed of the gospel, and that's why Paul said that. So letter B is we are rooted by the Spirit. We're rooted by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit living inside of us is a powerful source of power, rooted in the Spirit. Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and to all Judea and to Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So when we're saved, we're born of the Spirit. John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So we're born of the Spirit. So the Spirit of God dwells in, a, in us at the moment of salvation and begins a ministry of in our hearts. It's in our hearts. Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. You see, when you think about your role as an ambassador for Christ, you might think that you are somewhat inadequate, that you don't measure up to other people. You need to stop doing that because God has given each one of us spiritual gifts and we should not compare our gifts to what someone else has. Maybe you're not a big speaker. You know, maybe you're not a, a, a strong teacher. Maybe you don't speak eloquently like some people. It's okay. God has given you the Holy Spirit. If you are saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and you got all you need, all that you need. See, it's not a you getting more of the Holy Spirit. That's in the, the discipleship lessons. It's the Holy Spirit getting more of you. That's what's important. And so um, when you think about it, we are inadequate if we don't have the power of, the, of God's Spirit. If we don't have that, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are inadequate because you don't have any power. So, you know, make sure you get that right. You see, with the Spirit of God indwelling us, we can boldly tell others about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Biblical ministry is the incredible responsibility of being an ambassador of Christ and delivering the word of reconciliation, which is the gospel message. So the word of reconciliation is the gospel message. So finally, as I close, are you rooted in ministry? Are you regularly and consistently witnessing for Christ? Are you dependable and ready to give an answer to those who ask? Are you faithful in creating opportunities to share the gospel? And, and finally, are you maintaining the balance between ministry in your personal life? That's why I harped on the men, and I said what I said, and it's for women too, but I just know that we men have issues and with that because we seem to think certain things are so important that we forget about those who are in our lives. And, and so we have to make sure, and ladies, the same thing. If, you know, if you're single, you know, whatever, you, you need to know that you have people in your life. You have kids, you have family, you have all of that. And so make time for that. You know, don't, don't feel like that the show won't go on without me. No, it will go on without you. You know, as, as I've been in so many funerals here lately, it's just like I'm saying, I need a wedding. You know, it's, it's like, it's like, and people don't understand, and I watch families and how they go through this, and they struggle after that person is gone. And, you know, when you stop and think about it, it's like, well, what did you do while they were alive? You know? Were you investing anything into their lives? And so it's important for each one of us to recognize the power that Christ gives us and that we can have fruits in our ministry if we consistently give it over to him and we're willing to share the gospel. Amen? Amen. So we got a little bit of time left, so I think there's still some yogurt back there and some muffins and things like that. So uh, you got a few minutes and you can go back and get that, and so uh, real quick, uh, Pam is out of town today, but the email went out talking about the new dinner theater. That's gonna be in September. You still have time, but you need to respond this week to saying, I wanna go. You don't have to turn in the money because we've already put a deposit down, but I know there's eight or 10 more spots left, 
I believe. So uh, respond to her email or send me a text and say, put my name down, put us down. I think it's about 62 or $63 a person. But that's the show and your food. And it's a buffet, so you can go back more than once. And it's <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's, it's a, and it's a good show called Dream Girls. And so uh, Google it, and you can see how that was a, such a nice uh, play and music. So, all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for our time today. I thank you so much for such an awesome opportunity to share the Word of God. And, and Lord, we don't take it for granted because we are ambassadors for you. And we thank you so much for the sacrifice on the cross. You became sin for us. And so, Lord, we, ha we have to be obligated to share the gospel message to others. I pray that that message will continue today in our worship services. I pray, Lord, that if there are some folks that come in and who don't know you, that they will accept you as their Lord and Savior. So we pray for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.